So we are continuing in, in Ephesians to walk through Ephesians that were that were taken. We've got another week, and then on the I didn't announce this earlier, but on the seventeenth, you know what's happening? Homecoming. Seventeenth is homecoming. homecoming, and and if you have anyone's email, anyone's address, get that to us. We're going to be sending cards out this week, but we'd also like to send email uh, messages to them as, to them as well. Anyone who's attended here or. Anyone who, who would be interested in, in an Arbor Point homecoming, we would love to see them. Um, the passage today is out of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through chapter 5, verse 2. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, all brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ Jesus forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Have you ever moved? Anybody ever moved? It's fun, isn't it? You did a lot of packing, you put a lot of stuff away in boxes. Some things that you'd accumulate and you could throw away, but other things for some unknown reason travel with us from one place to the next place to the next place to the next place. We just decide we need to hang on to those those things that, that uh, uh, we, were important at one point and then, you know, they live in our garage in a box and we don't get it out until it's time to move the next time. And we're always amazed when we do come to the new place and we go through all those boxes and we start to find some things that that we didn't know were there. It's fun when we find the things we do, but it's more fun when we find a little treasure here and there. Um, I had a fly fishing rod. Um, it was given to me on my birthday and or Christmas. I'm not really sure. Sometimes my birthday and Christmas were one thing since I'm born on December 22nd. So it was, it might have been one present. That rod traveled with us from Oregon to Nebraska to Georgia. And it never caught one fish. And that's <laughs> it tried, <laughs> yeah. but it didn't ever. It didn't ever work. You know, it, I got it out of in Oregon. I, it was you know, I, fly fishing was more getting out on the Deschutes River and just being on the Deschutes River. I didn't really care if I caught anything anyway. But but it is funny that thing traveled across the United States of America, and it got here before I got rid of it. <laughs> And this is not a move per se, but when my mom passed, the four remaining kids and I went through all of the boxes and all of the stuff that she had stored away. And we lived in a two-story house, and you can imagine, with, with five kids, and we all left, and then all of our stuff accumulated in the attic and in the, these different places. And, and so we started to go through this, and I had no idea of the things that my mom had kept. I had report cards from second grade. You know, um, drawings from from elementary school, just these you know incredible things. And I and I and I, and I, I know you may not know this, but I am a potter. 
I, I made a whale when I was probably in third or fourth grade. It was a, it was a black, you know, uh, pottery clay thing that I had put in the kiln myself, and we, and we made it. And it was there, by golly. She had kept that thing as misshapen as it was. And so there's all of these things that, that she had kept. And we had a lot of laughs and a lot of tears as we searched through all those things that were left behind. Because we find strange things when we begin to look. And that's true when we open boxes, but it's also true when we open the Bible. I've heard it said that we can read the Bible like a newspaper, or we can read the Bible like a love letter. The news of the world, it hardens us and we stand apart from it. You're right, Mike. Hang on. Thank God. Whoever invented capos, man, they do all kind of stuff. <laughs> but the world does, it hardens us and, and it makes us impervious. We get a shell around us because we just don't want to be hurt. So we protect ourselves. A love letter calls us into relationship. It calls us closer. And in our Sunday school uh, class, we've been talking about this, is that the spirit of Paul's letter to the Ephesians is just different. You know, he's, he's talking to a group of people in Ephesus that, that it's a love letter to, and, and it's an incredible thing. That, that these kind of letters call us to a way of life. College causes us to, to look and to think, do my words, do my actions build other people up? Or do they tear them down? What am I doing as a Christian, as a father? Are, am I showing the grace that I've received to others? See, we're to put away the old life. I was talking to Cindy this morning. One of these days, we're going to get somebody up here and baptize them in the, in the hot tub. It's a hot tub. It won't be cold. <laughs> But that it, it, we're gonna, you know, and and, and it, the, the, I love the the imagery of baptism. I'm gonna move forward because I can't see. Yeah. There, there, there. Hey, girl. There, that's a little bit better. Now at least I can. Hey, Sean, how's it going? <laughs> but the imagery of baptism is going under and dying to the old life. But you don't stay under the water, right? You rise back up, and it's rising to a new life. It's a new creation. It's becoming who God would have you to be, and we are to become made new. And Paul is asking that of the church at Ephesus. We are to imitate God. We're to live in love, remembering that we love because Christ loved us first, and he gave himself for us. In Ephesians 4, just prior to today's passage, Paul wrote this. He's, this is 4, verses 2 through 4. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, he's writing this in prison, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, you may not know this, but everybody here has faults. That's just crazy, isn't it? Everyone here has faults. I have them. You have them. So we have a choice. We can look at those faults and, and we can love people through them or we can berate them and point them out and put them down. But we are a new creation, so we want to love them into who God created them to be. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit. Just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. And this is sometimes translated as tenderness or meekness. But one of the best meanings that, I, that I've come across is this. A gentleness is a teachable spirit. When we talk about being humble and gentle, gentleness is to have a teachable spirit, to be willing 
to hear somebody else instead of formulating the argument and as they're speaking, I'm formulating my response. Or am I, I'm the only one who does that. So, you know, as somebody's talking and you're going, well, I'm going to say this when they get done. So I only hear half of what they say. Instead of doing that, actually be present and hear them. Gentleness is a teachable spirit. It's a life not hardened. It's a life still being shaped and molded like clay in the hands of a potter. And we have the best potter there is. We have the best potter there is. He's molding us and shaping us. Several weeks back, we, we watched a video by the skit guys about being sculpted, about all the things being chiseled off of us so that we might, when people look at us, they might see Jesus that our reflection would be him instead of us. One sign that the Holy Spirit's growing in our lives is a basic quality of gentleness, humility, and having that teachable spirit. We all have something to learn. And the truth is that those of us who've been around a day or two will tell you, we were at one point younger, we were smarter than we are now because as we've gotten older, we've discovered how much we don't know. Because there's a lot more to learn than what we realize when we're young. So we become more open, this idea of a teachable spirit, we become more open to the lessons that God has for us, because he has lessons for each of us, the understanding that God has in store for us. And a teachable spirit is a sign that God, who is present in our lives, is, is with us through everything. He is consistent. He is faithful. He will walk us through everything, even eight years of speech therapy. <laughs> It'd be easy to shut all this stuff out, right? To, 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 to put aside the fact that every relationship of love requires us to be open to all kinds of things. Love and joy, pain and suffering, delight and laughter, tears and despair. All of that comes. If you've been in a relationship, you, all of that stuff has been a part of that. It'd be easy to shut all that out and say, I don't need God or I can figure this out on my own. And God could overpower us, but God doesn't do that. He doesn't overpower us. He rarely speaks in thunder and lightning. He speaks in the still, small voice that gets to you when, when you let yourself get quiet enough to hear. Because he wants to speak to each of us. He wants to meet us where we are and not leave us there. The power of God is in, found in weakness and humility, right? For we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is completely backwards from what the world teaches us. It's upside down. But Paul is making a point. He goes further, further on it. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. If we'll rely on the one who has the answers and the one who has the strength, we'll be better off. And the gentle power of God comes to us as a gift. It's offered to each of us. It reminds us of a profound and important truth. We are loved. You are loved. Right where you are, you are loved. God's love for you is not going to go anywhere. It's with you everywhere that you go. It's just not going to go anywhere. He wants that close of a relationship with you. And a teachable spirit is what allows us to experience the reality of this love in our lives and what that means. Because some of, some of us know that love, when, 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 it's, when we talk about love, that it has this connotation that it's always soft. If you've dealt with any substance abuse or anything like that, you know sometimes the hardest thing to do is to set boundaries. Love is not always soft. Sometimes it has an edge to it, but God's love will lead us and guide us. When we're off track, we need somebody to bring us back because we can't do it on our own. Sometimes it's difficult for us because you just don't want to appear weak. You know? I don't want to appear weak. I, I want to look like I have it all together. And that can harden us. We learn to survive 
We learn to exist, but we don't learn to thrive. And God would have us thrive, guys. God would have us thrive. He would have us be a force in this community of ours. He would have us be a force in our families. It's letting him lead us. But it will never happen if we don't develop a teachable spirit. It's like opening up the window and allowing the wind to come in. Move, move over us. Have you ever done that on a day? I bet you have out here in San Diego. We open one of these windows and just the, the wind blows through. And it just washes over us. And that sense of, okay, I get a sense of the power and the presence of God. I, I understand what it means to surrender, maybe, maybe for the first time. And there's power in that. John Wesley has a prayer. It's called the Wesley Covenant Prayer. It echoes the prayer of Jesus in the garden. It goes like this. It says, I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you will. Rank me with, with who you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Put me, let me be employed for thee and laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. I'm no longer my own, but yours. And that's what surrender is. It's when we let go of ourselves. That's what gentleness brings us. That's what a teachable spirit can bring. When that spirit of gentleness is growing in our lives, we tend to care less and less about our own significance. The need for ourselves to look like we've got it all together. We become living sacrifices, right? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to become living, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We've been crucified with Christ. As Paul would later write to the Galatians. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. This is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he knew the law. He understood the Jewish customs. For the, through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in my body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's surrender. That's becoming teachable. And it will change our lives. Father, I pray for us as a congregation, for us as a people, that we might embrace that which you ask us to do. That we would become teachable. That we would let go of the things that prevent us from walking fully into the places that you would have us to be. Lord, help us to shine a light. To shine gentleness and love and transformation and all of the things that you want to do through us. Help us as a congregation to engage with one another, with our families, with this community. We ask for your blessing, Lord. We ask for your blessing on Arbor Point Church, for each family here and those who couldn't make it. Lord, we pray that each of us would become more and more like your son. Help us to walk freely in the grace and the love that you extend to us. Keep us from taking for granted all that it costs. Show us the path, Lord. Amen.